to mm. Anurag because he has the kind of sensibility to make such a film. So I remember we went to his house and his film Black Friday had just been stopped yeah. because of a court case. Uh, and he was like depressed and, you know, um, but I went and narrated the story to him and uh, he said, uh, Sir, James Elroy, banayenge. Uh, For some of us who come from Bihar, uh, mm. that work which was about uh, bonded labor in uh, Gaya uh, right. was was an, a starting point. And then we also see very detailed account on Bombay and of course uh, your chron well chronicled account of uh, emergency. So some idea of your intellectual journey would be good to start with. Yeah, well, you know, actually, uh... I may, I may start with Patna. Uh, so after my high school, I was doing my uh, BA in Patna College. And mm -hmm. um, and I sort of didn't know any better. And in fact, in school, I had done biology. And uh, uh, it so happened that, you know, the destination for anyone who wanted to do science was to go to science college. And my sister was doing her MSc at Science College at that time. And so I depended on her to tell me, you know, when my name came on the list or didn't come and so on. So she came and told my father that my name had come. But my father told her, don't tell him. <laughs> because, uh, uh, actually, he is more interested in the humanities. But because there is such a hawa that everyone must do science right. yeah that you know he will go and do science but you know that's not what his interest is so as far as i knew i didn't get into science college so i joined patna college and started you know uh, ba honors in history and, and you were from patna originally yeah yeah although i was born in hazaribagh and my, I did my initial schooling in Hazaribagh, and then uh, my parents moved to Patna. So, uh, so I spent you know most of my mm. young life in in Patna. And uh, so, when that happened, I, you know, I did uh, start, I joined BA Part One, and then I met uh, someone uh, in Patna College who was several years senior to me, and he said you know, you're wasting your time here. Uh, mm. You should go to Delhi. Uh, I didn't know anything about Delhi. I'd been to Delhi once in my life. And uh, so I said, okay. And so, you know, I applied and I got into Kirorimal College and I joined there. And I think that was really, for me, a kind of an intellectual uh, awakening because uh, there was a professor I mean, everyone has a, a teacher in their life who's been, you know, very important. And he was one such person. He was uh, called Imtiaz Hussain. And uh, Imtiaz uh, had done his PhD from SOAS and had come back. And he was a very lonely figure in KM College because he was completely um, academically driven. He had no... Uh, time for any academic politics and he was very arrogant mm. uh, intellectually very arrogant he thought everyone else was a fool uh, so I remember my first year uh, history class he used to teach British history and he really got me into thinking about social history um, and reading very widely uh, with him and so I, I was just kind of taken by, you know, everything that he offered. Um, and, you know, he got me to read uh, a number of different things in my first year. And um, and he would often tell the principal, whose name was Mangatram, he said, Mangatram, you are a fool. You haven't read Hegel, you haven't read Marx, you are a fool. <laughs> uh, he, so he was that kind of uh, uh, intellectually very arrogant person. And in fact, 
uh, his book, which he did on land revenue system in uh, UP, uh, it has a very interesting preface, which I still remember, which says, intellectual tradition in India does not exist. Uh-huh. This is the effort to begin it. So then I went to JNU and, uh, and I, you know, I think JNU, I credit a lot for, you know, the history program was really very innovative for its time. And, uh, you know, there were great professors. I learned a lot. Uh, uh, but very and, early on, the very early uh, days of JNU. Yeah. So, I mean, I joined in 73 and mm. uh, it had been in existence just for since uh, 71. And the history program had actually, MA program had started in 72. So I was like a second year batch. Right. Uh, and uh, and there was one person, Majid Siddiqui, who mm. was on faculty and Majid had been in MA when I was in my first year in Delhi University. So uh, I knew him um, and we were friends, but uh, but he was on faculty. And so, I mean, JNU, I think I, I learned a lot and I also got involved in politics, student politics. And uh, in my very first year, I was in AISF and AISF and SFI had an alliance and we won and I was the general secretary and Prakash Karat was uh, president and, and so on. So, so that politics was, uh, you know, also part of the environment. But, you know, JNU at that time, uh, and I suppose even now, you know, had a, an idea. It was, we, we had a slogan, study and struggle. So uh, mm-hmm. doing politics meant that you also, you know, at the same time read a right. lot. And and at that time there was this uh, person, uh, Jairus Banaji. Uh, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Jairus was doing his PhD in history, mm. and he was an amazing figure. Uh, he had just come back from Oxford, and he knew several languages. You know, he he would uh, translate uh, various German writers into English and cyclostyle them, and you know, distribute them. Uh, and uh, and I remember, you know, the student union elections, you know, uh, Jairus would often go to uh, various classes and he would say, uh, he would request the professors to give him like five or ten minutes for a speech. Mm-hmm. And because he had a certain stature, they all accommodated him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he would have, a, I remember one, he spoke about Levi-Strauss and how Levi-Strauss mm-hmm bourgeois uh, theorist and so on you know i mean uh-huh. he was he, he was really great and i think he did a lot to really raise the intellectual level um, yeah. mm-hmm. at jnu so jnu was very um, formative th- in that way um but there was another side of jnu which was uh, and i think you know one of the reasons i left uh, jnu was that um uh, I felt intellectually I had reached a kind of a plateau um, hmm. in the history department. There was a, you know, sort of a left Marxist uh, framework, but I felt that it only went so far and I wanted to explore something more. And I just felt that intellectually it was, you know, I had gotten everything I could get. Hmm. Uh, but. Uh, but I think the trigger was, so that was one intellectual motivation. But the other trigger was that the history center was a kind of a, a monolithic block. And if you cross them, mm. they came at you with vengeance. <laughs> I mean, really. And it was, uh, I remember, you know, it, it was in JNU Old Campus and Sometimes when you were going to the cafeteria at around lunchtime, the whole history department would walk together. And it was a very intimidate look <laughs> be. you, Yeah, because if you were against them, I mean, you were faced with, you know, from uh, Bipin Chandra to, you know, everyone, you know, and they were like a solid block and, and they would just come down like a hammer on you. And... And I had crossed their path, partly because of student politics. 
because the student union had uh, accused uh, the history department of using the um, interview, oral interview, as mm -hmm. a way to uh, admit mainly um, people of you know upper class backgrounds from St. Stephen's. All right. And and so we went on a strike, and of course, history department was under the scanner for this. And it actually it was after that strike that JNU introduced uh, this system of you know giving weightage to uh, socioeconomic yeah. background and and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because our experience was, I mean, you looked at the uh, class and you know 80 percent were you know from um, either you know Delhi University and largely St. Stephen's or you know the rest 20 percent also scattered rest of India uh, but from you know premier institutions you know mm -hmm. uh, presidency college Calcutta and, and, and so on you know mm -hmm. uh, so because of that you know they held it against me and so when I applied for MPhil, uh, I was denied admission. And no one would actually say why. Um, and so I remember I went to one faculty member and I said, you know, just off the record, tell me, I mean, what is it? And he said, okay, off the record. Uh, people felt that um, you would be too political and you were doing only for politics. Uh, and I said, but, you know, you admitted these people whom I know and you know too, who were only applying to JNU in order to get hostel accommodation and they were writing for the IAS. They had yeah. no intention of completing the MPhil. They were just looking for an accommodation. He yeah. said, yeah, yeah, but, you know, people felt that uh, your politics will come in the way. So... I mean, I was shocked. I mean, I never, I mean, I had a good record, and, you know, I never thought that they would go to this extent. So that was really uh, a very disappointing and frustrating moment. And, you know, I, I was teaching in Jamia after my MA. Mm -hmm. And, and I, then the following year, uh, JNU admitted me. But, you know, it was very clear that I would have to behave. And I just didn't want to stay under those conditions. Uh, so, but then I started applying abroad. Uh, and like most people in India, you know, I applied to Cambridge, uh, through a colonial hangover. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I got into St. Catherine's College and, you know, uh, I got a partial uh, scholarship. Uh, but then I happened to meet uh, an American uh, anthropologist historian. His name is Tom Kessinger. I don't know if he's still alive. Uh, but he had done a book on Punjab called Vilayatpur. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was a, a really um, a model study for that time of how to use both history and anthropology to do a kind of village study, mm -hmm. which was both ethnographically very rich, but also historically oriented. Uh, and he was then working with Ford Foundation. And I, I forget where I ran into him and, you know, and I got talking to him and he said, well, if your interest is that, why are you going to Cambridge? Because, you know, in Cambridge, it's a very good institution, but they will uh, welcome you and they'll say, okay, now go to the archive, you know. Mm -hmm. So you should come to America. Uh, and because, you know, there you do coursework and you study anthropology. And he happened to have a faculty position at uh, Penn. Uh, so he said, you know, you apply to Penn and come there. So I applied to Penn, got in. And when I went there the first day, you know, you come from India, uh, the sort of supervisor is a big figure. Mm. Uh, and so the first thing you do is, you know, go and pay respect to your supervisor. Yes. So I went to the history department office and uh, I said, you know, want to meet uh, Tom Kessinger. He said, Tom, oh, he left for Indonesia. 
as huh? Ford Foundation chief. It's like, what? You know, it's like, uh, you know, I mean, at that point, I di didn't know what to do. I mean, I, you know, my whole thing was sort of based on his presence there. Hmm. So for the first two years, I, you know, the, I didn't have any faculty member at Penn who worked on South Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, but everyone else was very supportive and they said, no, no. Uh, I applied actually then to Berkeley to transfer and I got in and, uh, but then everyone at Penn said, no, 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 you stay here. We'll hire somebody and, you know, you're doing well. Why do you want to go, et cetera? So I stayed and then they hired uh, David Ludden in my third year. And oh. uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so that was, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, I think after JNU, I felt uh, Penn to be uh, intellectually not as stimulating, mm -hmm. partly because it seemed like very apolitical. Uh, and having come from JNU, uh, yes. <laughs> it just seemed like, uh, have I made a mistake? <laughs> but, uh, but I think... Uh, Penn gave me this opportunity to, um, you know, do all these courses in anthropology and they had that ethno history program. They had a weekly seminar where you would have either a historian or anthropologist, you know. So that was actually intellectually very, you know, nourishing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, yeah, so that was, uh, and then, you know, uh, I wanted to, uh, yeah, that that was the time for you know agrarian history. Everyone was doing agrarian history, and so, mm -hmm. so reading a lot of literature on peasants and so on. And I wanted to do some work on that. And uh, uh, and I had done some uh, you know coursework uh, at JNU in my MPhil on agrarian history, and so I thought you know I'll develop that. Uh, so then I thought of you know working on bonded labor. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, when I uh, went to Bihar, so of course I went to the archive, and you know, yeah, yeah. Hmm. that was uh, that's another story. So, <laughs> in your Gaya work, uh, we see that interface of history and anthropology quite uh, in nuanced manner. It comes. Yeah, through. but that was you know because when I was reading, uh, I started reading the documents and in uh, the archive and I found uh, that the story that I wanted to tell and that I already knew uh, was already in the documents. There was nothing new that I was discovering. It just seemed like, you know, I was in a circuit where the definition of what a bonded laborer was, what its history was, uh, it was kind of already written. Um, mm. And, you know, I remember meeting at that time various people, you know, who would ask me, uh, to kya kar rahe ho? you know, I'd say, you know, I'm working on bonded labor in Bihar. Oh, Bihar. Yes, of course. Very backward. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's very feudal. And, and so, you know, so I, uh, I thought, well, you know, this is all in the air and it's also in the document. So what is the new thing that I'm discovering here? Right. Um, I'll just be repeating what's already sort of mm. said about bonded labor. So I thought I need to do something else. So that's when I went to Gaya. Mm. And I was so naive. I remember I went to both there and I went to the pawn shop over there. And uh, I needed some kind of a local connection. Mm. And I thought the best way to do it is through, there was a Chhatra Sangash Samiti. And... Mm. Uh, and these were old uh, sort of JPites uh, um, who uh, had, you know, after the end of the JP movement and so on, they had become very radicalized and they had led some land struggle mm -hmm. um, in the Bodhgaya area. And there had been a kind of police firing and so on. Um, so I thought, well, you know, maybe I can make connections through them because they have connections to, you know, uh, the area and land struggle. So I went to the pawn shop and I said, you know, 
where do I meet Chhatra Sangat Samiti? And the guy looked at me like I was crazy. Wow. Because, you know, many of them were like uh, underground and, you know, <laughs> and I was asking at a pawn shop. You know, so. mm. uh, but then I happened to meet uh, actually in a chai shop over there, uh, a local MLA who was from the CPI. And he then put me in touch with someone um, in in a village uh, who was who was a Dalit uh, uh, young man. And he uh, he was educated. Uh, he said, you know, he will know things over here. So his name was Anhach Manji. And so I went to meet him and he was very uh, nice and open. And, you know, uh, he took me around. And so then I started, uh, you know, working in these villages and I got to know them. And, you know, it took a while because, you know, first they thought I was some government official. They would mm. call me Director Saab, you know. <laughs> I said, I'm not Director Saab, you know. Uh, but slowly, you know, as... I mean, I think to begin with, they were uh, surprised why I would be interested in uh, the Bhuyas who used to live there and yeah. who were, really, mm. uh, you know, the uh, bonded laborers. And so initially they were, you know, curious why I would be interested in... Um, did, did I have an ulterior motive? Uh, was I bringing yeah. some government program? So after all that was cleared, um, mm. and I, you know, already spent, you know, several months, uh, you know, in uh, in the village. Um, then they started opening up to me, and then they would uh, invite me to, you know, whatever celebration they had. You know, they would. Um, you know, slaughter a pig and, you know, all sorts of, I mean, then they became really, you know, very uh, warm, generous. And, and I, and that's when I started then thinking, uh, uh, doing a kind of uh, collection of their oral traditions. And this was partly uh, also, you know, suggested by, you know, anthropologist at Penn when, Mm. I was going to do my research and I asked him for some advice. He said, you know, one thing that you can do is uh, do what he, what he called biography of things. He said, so you can um, ask for the biography of a piece of land. Now, if you ask them directly who owns it and, you know, how you came right. to work on it, they may not tell you. But if mm. you ask for the biography of the land itself, or it could be for a hutment, that biography will tell you a, a lot of things. And I found that a very useful advice so that uh, uh, I didn't start by asking, you know, what do you people believe in and so on. So I started asking about, you know, um, so there was uh, a little shrine over there. And I, so I asked, started asking, when was this built? And, you know, what do you do there and so on. And that's how this whole world of kind of oral traditions, you know, opened up to me. And so I, I don't know, listened to, I don't know, innumerable kind of performances of these uh, oral traditions. Um, and I found that actually, you know, everyone in that community knew these traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and they had heard them several times. Uh, and I didn't want to treat that as mere folklore. Um, mm. uh, when, you know, if you treat it as folklore, it becomes something kind of a legend and, you know, uh, it's something else. I wanted to sort of see, you know, what it meant and what it's, uh, how I could use it in order to reconstruct a certain history. Mm. Um, so, and I think being uh, in that village, and then I traveled around all the, surrounding villages that was a very key moment in rethinking everything that i'd been doing and so i also kept going to the archive i went to the district record room in gaya um, uh, and that back and forth was helpful uh, and it also made me uh, rethink what i was reading in in the archive um, so and there seemed to be such a disjunction between the discourse that I was reading in the archival documents uh, 
which seemed to be more about how the state saw it rather yeah. than the actual mm-hmm. conditions of bonded labor. And, and what the Bhuyas were telling me was the way in which they had experienced uh, their lives. And so, and these two seem to be at odds. And so, for me, I think uh, that interaction was really crucial. And it was after I finished my dissertation, then I had this kind of postdoc at uh, uh, Wesleyan uh, University for a year and then at Caltech. And at Wesleyan, uh, the other postdoctoral fellow was um, Judith Butler. Uh, she had just finished her PhD from Yale in philosophy and she was the other postdoctoral fellow. And so that year, you know, I just put aside my dissertation and just read kind of widely. Um, And then when I went to Caltech, I rethought the whole dissertation and uh, in light of, you know, everything that I had thought, read afterwards and then uh, I still didn't know, you know, when I finished my dissertation, I still no, didn't know how to uh, understand what I was reading in the archive. You know, I kind of described them and analyzed them, but I still didn't have a kind of a whole handle on how to understand them. So it was that period, you know, at Wesleyan and then at Caltech that helped me sort of rethink what it meant in terms of the state discourse and then what its relationship was. So, yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> and it just so happened that, you know, I, while I was doing this uh, subaltern study, it was happening on a sort of yeah. parallel track and I, I had no connection uh, with that at that time. Uh, I was coming to that. I was, I was coming to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, I uh, when I was at Caltech, actually, they had organized a, a seminar in which, uh, Ranjit Guha came and uh, when uh, I met him and uh, I had published a, a, an article in Modern Asian Studies from my dissertation, so which he had read and and he said, uh, Gyan, you write about Bhuts, you are a subaltern. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, and then I later on thought about it, uh, which is that in fact, when I had come across all these kind of stories about, you know, spirit cults and so on, um, mm. I mean, they were, uh, you know, normally treated anthropologically as, you know, right. uh, expressions of culture. But um, no one, I, as far as I knew, had kind of seen them as part of the social mix, you know. Mm. Uh, and so... So anyway, so he said, you are a subaltern and, you know, um, he also said to me, he said, uh, where are you from? I said, from Bihar. Oh, you're almost a Bengali. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, then I got to also know, you know, Shahid in particular. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, and Shahid is such a live mind. Uh, and he's also very earthy. Uh, I mean, you know him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. He is also very earthy. He has kind of really ear to the ground. And uh, and he's also personally very nice and generous. So uh, we became friends and, you know. Mm. So uh, I wanted to uh, uh, come here and uh, point out uh, about your turn to history of science mm-hmm. and Bay in particular. I understand your interest in uh, emergency history, given mm. your background in uh, JNU, mm. where, as your account informs us, a lot mm. of things begin to happen at JNU among, uh, related to that student's politics. Yeah. And my, my favorite uh, uh, part was the cameo appearance of Menaka Gandhi in that book. <laughs> 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 that is, that's really cinematic, to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> But well, I, want you know, to... I, I mean, when I think back, I, I'll come to uh, science too, but, you know, when I think back mm-hmm. uh, of my kind of academic career and how I've moved from one to the other, 
So, I mean, there are different models. Um, many people start with uh, something and they go deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and that's one model of academic scholarship. For me, uh, after I had done one thing, I've always felt that, you know, I've said what I had to say. Uh, and that if I do more um, in, in that field, maybe it will become richer and deeper. But it sort of didn't excite me anymore to do research in that. And I feel that, you know, when you do research, um, it has to, it's such a self-motivated thing that it has to excite you in some way. Mm. Um, and so after I had done the bonded labor book, I didn't want to go back and, you know, go over the same ground again, maybe with, you know, broader focus and, you know, expanding the regional picture and so on. I said, well, you know, that will be valuable in itself, but it didn't sort of excite me to do it all over again. I, would, I, would, I thought that I would be, you know, not growing in any way. Hmm. Uh, and just so happened that I was at Caltech. And so because Caltech was such a an institution of military industrial complex and science and so on, uh, it got me interested in, in science. And it also so happened. Uh, so I started working on science because I was at Caltech. And, I, and I, then I remembered, you know, my own history of, you know, shifting from biology to humanities. And then in college, you know, everyone thought that, you know, uh, so we had a term, I don't know if you still have that, you know, the science type. So the science ah. type was, you know, considered to be nerdy, uh, not interested in anything else, but just, you know, in the lab and so on. Uh, but still, science had a certain authority. And so, you know, in kind of late night sort of drunken discussions about life and the world, uh, the clinching argument was, it's scientific. Uh, yeah. and you, if you prove that it was scientific, then, you know, that was the ultimate court of appeal. Mm. Uh, so I kind of remembered all that, that how science had this authority. And I began to think about how to write a history of really the culture of science's authority in India, rather than I didn't want to do kind of a history of physics in India or history of chemistry in India, but really how science comes to acquire this kind of authority. And so actually when I moved from Caltech to Princeton, uh, in the very first year, uh, I got a letter from uh, a friend at Caltech. She was uh, actually an editor of the um, Caltech sort of magazine. It's called Engineering and Science. Uh, and she sent me a letter and she said, you know, Gyan, I'm writing to you on kind of official matter. Uh, we've recently received this letter from, uh, from Bengal. I mean, you know, she didn't have much idea of, about Bengal and so on. But uh, then she uh, sent me the letter. And the letter was from a village in Midnapur. And this man in the letter said, Dear Sir, Madam, uh, I live in Midnapur in Bengal, West Bengal. And uh, recently my wife gave birth to uh, our daughter. We think she's going to be a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> we, we think that um, when she grows up, uh, she should go and study in a place, a premier institution like Caltech or MIT and so on. Uh, and that in our culture, uh, when such a genius is born, it is auspicious to bury the child's umbilical cord in a place of great tradition like a temple or church or a university. So I'm hereby enclosing her umbilical cord and oh. 
with the request that you please bury it in your campus. So, <laughs> so she said, you know, this is what uh, either the letter came and we took out the envelope and read this and this kind of shriveled umbilical cord kind of popped out. So she said, so, you know, what should we do? I said, you know, you should respect the man's wishes, you know. Um, so anyway, they had a little ceremony and they buried her umbilical cord uh, at Caltech campus. Um, but it got me thinking, you know, here's this uh, man from a village in Midnapur, uh, who has obviously heard of Caltech and, of course, enterprising enough to send a letter. Um, and, you know, the kind of authority of a kind of a scientific institution is so high in his mind. Right. Uh, where does this come from? You know? uh, so, so that's what got me thinking about the authority of science. Mm. So, you know, if you think, I mean, if I think of my sort of a whole career, uh, I, I see myself uh, without realizing it, uh, doing really a kind of a history of modernity in India. Uh, the first was about labor and how free labor is uh, viewed as the kind of hallmark of modernity mm. and bonded labor is seen as a sign of backwardness and feudalism. Science again is seen as of course a preeminent science of uh, sign of modernity. Um, and then uh, moving to Bombay, I mean I, I have a kind of personal side to why I did Bombay but you know. Uh, Before Bombay if I may interfere yeah. I was because in that science work you have also I mean very beautiful I found that idea of showing how science is a staged reality like staging of science in that historical context yeah and which makes sense even today I mean by and large particularly the state variety of science mm -hmm. is a, a stage staged thing I mean there's a lot of orchestration involved you yeah. take example of this Chandrayaan business uh, or even yeah announcement but that by 15th of august we will have uh, uh, the vaccine to cope with the coronavirus ready so this kind of staging that business of staging continues yeah but the state enterprise of science yeah i mean you know i i think um, it, because i was interested in seeing how that authority of science is built yeah. in here it seemed very clear uh, from the very beginning that the performance of science right. was as important as the content of it uh, exactly. itself. And so, you know, it was, uh, it's so magical, and therefore it's science. You know, it was almost like saying, you know, right. here I will demonstrate what science can perform. It performs almost like magic and therefore it must be true. Yeah. Uh, and that was very much really part of, and I think this was, also the kind of a conundrum that the British faced uh, where they say, well, you know, Indians are, you know, superstitious and irrational and so on. Um, so we have to perform science in a way uh, that addresses their proclivity to magic. Uh, and once we show that, you know, science can be performed this way, um, you know, its authority will be established. Uh, so the staging part of it was very much, you know, uh, part of its history. And so, you know, it was very clear when uh, I was looking at the records of uh, the uh, agricultural fairs uh, in the 19th right. century, right. going into kind of establishing its uh, authority. Well, that was very much, it was there in mesmerism. I mean, I, I found that, uh, and and then you know you come to all the way to like Nehru and you know through, uh, yes, yes. The modern temples of modern India. I mean there was very much this idea that you yeah. know uh, they ha it has to have a kind of a demonstrative effect, mm. uh, and so it has to be staged. And you know and certainly it's part of Chandrayaan and it's all um, the kind of public spectacle is very much part of it. Yeah. So then, yeah. 
sorry. Uh, yeah, so, you know, so then I, you know, after I finished that, uh, uh, that book and, um, I, and then I started to think, well, you know, the uh, cities are a kind of site for the modern and Bombay of all of Indian cities is seen as the kind of preeminent sign of modernity. Uh, and uh, but I had a kind of personal side to it, which is that, you know, growing up in Patna, we often used to hear, oh, Bombay Bhagya. Ah. Uh, you know, there were all these stories of people who had run off to Bombay to become film actors and so on. Mm. Uh, and uh, and then I remember uh, my uncle, uh, who used to live, he was much younger than my father. And so my father brought him up and when he was in college, I mean, we were kids and we remembered that he had run off to Bombay. Mm. Yeah, later on, I I talked to him and he said, no, no, no. Uh, I hadn't run off to Bombay. I had run off to Calcutta, actually. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the but Bombay sort of hovered so heavily in imagination as that place of, you know, beyond. Uh, where as an adolescent, if you are thinking of uh, that place beyond, uh, Bombay was that place. So, yeah. Not, yeah, so it's not surprising that I confuse Calcutta with Bombay and, you know, and Calcutta I knew because, you know, my uncle used to work in Calcutta, I'd been many times and so it didn't hold the same kind of uh -huh. magic power, but, you know, Bombay was just like, uh, so there was that sort of part of it. And so after I uh, finished my science book, as it's as intriguing, you know, uh, I was intrigued by, okay, so this has been with me since childhood. Uh, and I'd been to Bombay just once, once actually very briefly for a day. Uh, so I hadn't even been there really. Uh, so I thought maybe uh, I can do with this kind of memory and, you know, uh, write uh, history and so uh, so that took me to Bombay and uh, I remember actually I was uh, you know, I was taking a flight from JFK um, hmm. and I was going on in a taxi and part of the way in, kind of in Brooklyn you see these uh, huge kind of buildings you know they're actually affordable house building with multi-story buildings mm -hmm. um, and they were all lit up at night and i was going there and i suddenly realized you know the enormity of what i was undertaking with no background mm -hmm. um, that you know bombay would be something like this mm -hmm. and i i mean I, for a moment I, I just thought it was just completely foolhardy you know how could I do something like this? Uh, but, you know, something that's happened each time in my work is that when I take up something new, mm. so after labor, when I took up science, um, I have to learn a whole new bibliography. Um, it's like learning a new language, new right. scholarship, new traditions, new methodologies, and so on. So... Uh, in a way, it actually sort of also energizes me because every time I feel like I'm learning something new. Uh, so the same way when I started working on Bombay, um, I started reading this literature in urban theory, urban history. Uh, so before I went to Bombay, I mean, I had that kind of bibliography already sort of working in my head. But still, the enormity of the kind of a task was just staggering. Um, and so I went to Bombay and uh, I initially I was, uh, I had met uh, a woman called uh, Sally Holker. Uh, she's, uh, she's American. She's from Texas, actually. And she was married to someone from the Holker family of Indore. Um, and then, uh, but they are divorced now. 
Uh, and I met her in New York uh, at someone's house. And she said, well, if you're coming to Bombay, you know, uh, you're welcome to stay with me. My son has just left for college to the US. So his room is available. You can stay there. So she lives in Worley Seaface. And so I went initially, uh, stayed with her. And then I called, I, I had just one friend in Bombay that I knew from college. And I called him and so he was very warm. He said, uh, his name is Firoz, um, uh, Firoz and his wife Chandita Mukherjee. So I knew both of them uh, in college. Right. And so Firoz said, uh, so where are you staying? I said, in Worley Seaface. We got talking. He said, you want to work on the city? You want to you wanna live in Worley Seaface? You're never going to get any... Right. Really, real encounter the city, you come and stay with me. So he lives in Kolaba. He said, if you don't mind our kind of bohemian lifestyle, you know, you just come and stay as long as you want. I said, fine. So, you know, I shifted there and I was of the great advice because I was right in the thick of the city. Um, and through him, I also met a number of people. Um, but one thing that I discovered in Bombay uh, within, I would say, a few weeks of being there, uh, that Bombay had a different kind of uh, urban sensibility where people didn't ask you where you came from, why you were there. Uh, no one ever asked me why you're working on Bombay. It was just assumed that, you know, Bombay is important and everyone is interested. So there was a certain parochialism about it, you know. Uh, uh, but, you know, I made friends, like within three weeks, I had, you know, 15 friends and, you know, uh, and they were all very welcoming. And uh, it was just a completely different experience uh, for me compared to what I had encountered in Delhi. You know, in Delhi people would say, hmm, you know, where do you come from? Achha, your father. And no one ever asked me that in Bombay. Mm -hmm. So there was this kind of a urban sensibility where the idea was that, you know, the city is um, a patchwork of society where people come from different places and, yeah. and they constitute this society as a kind of a patchwork, you know. Uh, and I just sort of fit into that, you know. So, uh, so everything that I had as a kind of a myth in my head, uh, actually became richer. I mean, usually what happens is, you know, you have a myth and you go to the place and you say the place sucks, you know, it doesn't yeah. rise up to the myth. But here it just became more and more rich. And it, I just sort of fell in love with the city. And so between uh, 2000, when I started working on Bombay and 2009, I every year I spent at least three, four months uh, in the city. And then for writing Mumbai Fables, I was there for the for 18 months. Uh, and so, you know, Bombay became like a second home for me. Um, and, and I think part of the kind of research uh, on Bombay that was different was, uh, and I found this, you know, uh, repeatedly in my work, that I've had to kind of assemble my own archive. It's not as if, you know, even in a sort of bonded labor to begin with, you know, it's not as if you just go to the state archive and you write your book. I had to do oral history and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the same with the science book. Uh, <clears throat> it, uh, you know, there are some historians who, and I admire their skill, who can look at, let's say, one government department's work, let's say, sanitation. Okay. Right. And they can write a whole book based on just sort of sanitation. They, they may not call it, you know, it might be called something more sexy, but, you know, uh, but basically it would be based on that. And I found that the science that I was looking for, I wasn't going to find in one department that right. it would scattered across departments and 
I would have to assemble my own archive. So pamphlets and this kind of, so. Right. And I found the same thing with uh, Bombay too, that yes, I worked in the archive uh, and I got what I could get from the archive, but increasingly I felt what I got from the archive was a sort of a state view of what was going on. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was uh, really more interested in the experience of the city and uh, how the city was lived in people's heads. 2015 comes and almost all over the world, uh, particularly amongst academics, there is this uh, very juicy uh, gossip uh, doing rounds. Mm. Uh, the year is 2015, mm. the Bombay Velvet comes and mm. everyone starts wondering uh, as to how uh, you were convinced of uh, collaborating with some of those uh, uh, biggies from the Bollywood and uh, what was your experience and how did you, did you also come across any gossip uh, in uh, academic circle about uh, this collaboration? Like no. Karan Johar, Anurag Kashyap, his story. Yeah, well, you know, it, it just started, uh, it started almost by accident. Uh, so, I mean, one of the things in working in Bombay is that uh, you sort of run into people in yeah. the film. And so, uh, early around 2002, two three, you know, I uh, got to know uh, Rohan Sippy. Mm. And one day, uh, Rohan and I, we had gone to see a, a play. And then after the play, we went to his mother's house, which is on Valkeshwar, it's called White House, and okay. it overlooks Marine Drive. It was late at night, you know, and there was another person there and we were sipping whiskey and, you know, it was very nice. And so, and it has a beautiful view of the promenade. So, and, yeah. and there was a, a barge on which at that time there was a Chinese restaurant called Suzy Wong. Uh, so you could see, you know, Susie Wong kind of lit up. And so I just said to Rohan, I said, you know, Rohan, um, it's beautiful. People say that this is built on reclaimed lands as if somebody had a claim on it. When it's, <laughs> uh, when it's land stolen from the sea and we put the legal fiction of reclamation mm -hmm. to say that we are reclaiming something that was ours. Uh, okay. So he said, oh, how interesting. I've never heard this uh, described this way. You know, y you write me a treatment. Uh, so, no, I said, like, you know, there are hundreds of stories like this in Bombay, and you guys keep making this sort of chocolate wrap. <laughs> uh, he said, okay, you write me a treatment. Uh, so, you know, it was like whiskey. I said, yeah, sure. You know, and I went back and, you know, I forgot about it. And then he emailed me, said, you know, where's the treatment? I didn't even know what the treatment meant. Uh, so I Googled mm -hmm. it and it was like, okay, so you write a synopsis, and, uh, but a kind of a cinematic synopsis. Mm. So since I was doing research, uh, I thought, well, you know, uh, it should, you know, draw from my research and uh, the film should be able to say things that I cannot say uh, as a historical work. You know? Uh, but it should still kind of draw from it. And so since I was doing this work on reclamation and um, Marine Drive and Nariman Point and land scams and so on, so I knew from, you know, that there was a whole story of corruption over there. Um, uh, but how to put it in kind of cinematic terms and... Um, both capture how uh, Bombay inspires a certain kind of imagination of self-making and, uh, you know, self-growth. And at the same time, there is this whole story of the change of Bombay from an industrial city of factories to kind of post-industrial city of real estate and finance. Uh, so how to bring these kind of together? Um, and then at that time, I also read this uh, story that um, Naresh Fernandez had 
written about uh, this Konkani singer called Lorna, who mm. had come to Bombay in the 60s. And she was like 16 or 17 year old from Goa. And she became a sensation as a kind of a jazz singer in oh. Bombay. And she uh, fell in love with uh, another jazz musician who was many years older. Uh, and he was very abusive and so on. And so finally she left Bombay. Uh, so I had read this kind of story. So, okay, uh, I thought uh, I'll write a story where you can have a kind of a collision of these different worlds. So the world of the working class, the world of uh, real estate finance, um, mm. this transition from industrial to post-industrial city, um, and centered around this sort of jazz singer who comes from Goa. Uh, so that was the kind of a kernel in my head. And from that, I wrote a story in 2004. Uh, and I narrated it to uh, Anurag in 2004, I, I, I had a friend, uh, Ranjani Mazumdar, who uh, yes, she is, uh, yeah. Yeah. So she knew him and she said, you know, and by this time, you know, Rohan was involved in some other films. So she said, you know, you should talk to mm -hmm. Anurag because he has the kind of sensibility to make such a film. So I remember we went to his house and his film Black Friday had just been stopped yeah, yeah. because of a court case. Uh, and he was like depressed and, you know, um, but I went and narrated the story to him and uh, he said, uh, sir, James Elroy, banaying it. Uh, so, okay, you know, so, and, you know, he was true to his word. Um, and so that's when it kind of started, you know. Uh, but he said from the very beginning, he said, you know, if you uh, make any film, which is period film, um, uh, and I don't want to uh, cut corners and, you know, make something that looks terrible. Um, so it'll be very expensive film. And the only way in which any studio will fund such a uh, film is if you have stars. Right. So, so the next few years was sort of spent in just trying to get one star of another, you know, you spoke to Amir Khan and Anurag spoke to everyone, I think. And you know, every time I went to Bombay, we would meet and talk and uh, go further. And meanwhile, he was making sort of other films. And then I think with Dave D, his sort of fortune, Right. Yes, uh, yes. So that was uh, 2008. Uh, and 2008, mm -hmm. nine, I was uh, in Bombay writing Mumbai Fables. And I, in fact, timed my uh, leave from Princeton uh, so that I could write the book and the film would be made. And, you know, I would be there in Bombay while it was being made. Um, and then the economic crisis hit at that time. So no studio was sort of funding anything like that. Um, but I didn't quite understand all of this. So, I, you know, I was very impatient. I went to Anurag and said, Anurag, kuch karo, you know, like, I'm here for the year and, you know, like it's going. Uh, and, you know, he was supposed to write the script and I'd just written the story, but based on that, he would write the uh, script. And he said, sir, aap I said, I've never written a script. Said, no, no, but you write it and then we'll fix it. So, you know, I did what every academic does, uh, got, various books on script writing and, you know, I saw some model scripts and um, and I wrote the script and it was uh, during that year, uh, I was writing the script and I was writing Mumbai Fables. Uh, mm. And the, I think the, uh, the intertwining of the two was very interesting because uh, from my book and from my research, I could bring all the kind of historical details, you know, sort of things like what Art Deco looked like and, you know, right. set design. So, in fact, when I wrote the script, people not, often don't do it. 
um, in normal scripts, but I included all the kind of set design elements in the script itself. All right. Because I thought, you know, who knows these guys uh -huh. and I had no trust, you know, what, <laughs> what they would do. So I, I better pen it. So that I did. <clears throat> and on the other side, you know, so in <clears throat> writing scripts, you do what they call a one liner. So you write a one line uh, kind of summary of a scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and the theory goes is that if you cannot do in one line, maybe the uh, scene is not clear and direct enough. Uh, there's ambiguity about it or that it doesn't move the narrative. So basically, so you write, let's say, 130, these one-liners. And by reading these one-liners, you can see how the narrative progresses. Mm -hmm. So you really condense everything. and It makes you really ask what is essential in this mm -hmm. scene, which you can put in that one-liner. So as I was writing the script, I employed the same kind of principle in writing my book. Not for the whole chapter, but for uh, a whole section, I would say, I would write a one-liner, like exactly what is going on here. What do I want to say? What is really essential? And that helped to cut a lot of fat. Uh, okay. So in academic writing, it tends to be discursive, you know, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said right. that. Yes. No, you know, and so on. Uh, so it helped to make the book very kind of narrative driven. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I think I benefited from doing the two things at the same time. And it helped to develop my kind of you know, ability to tell a kind of historical narrative. Um, and so it's interesting that, you know, many journalists, I mean, I don't know, Indian journalists don't read anything, but anyway, many. <laughs> Uh, many journalists often uh, refer to my book as a novel or or, or semi-fictional account. I had one of the interviewers say, "Like it's not fiction, you know. It's a history <laughs> book, you know." Right. Uh, so this went on, and you know, I would keep calling Anurag and Kiaura, you know, was, and then finally, I think in 2012, I called him one day and. Uh, he said hello, and then somebody else came on the phone. He said, "Sir, uh, uh, you're Gyan Prakash." I said, "Yeah, but you know, who are you, and why are you answering Anurag's phone?" I'm Ranbir Kapoor, sir. I said, "Oh my God, holy shit!" Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he said, "I'm doing the film, and you know." And then we talked, and and then Anurag came back on the phone. He said, "Yeah, you know, he's on board, and you know, now everything is." happening and so um, so then you know after that I found that uh, well you know from what I know of uh, filmmaking in Hollywood and filmmaking in Bombay one major difference is that you know uh, the writer over here is sort of part of the process uh, Although, you know, you've written the script and then after that it goes into production, your role is not that direct. But the writer is still uh, involved in, you know, they often do a kind of workshop with the actors. Uh, yes. So yes. the actor then, you know, then the writer sort of said what he has in his mind about the character and so on, you know. Uh, in Bombay, they don't do any of that. You once you've written it, you are you know your chutti. You know? After that, uh, it's the director. Right. So the director has a much more important role uh, here. I mean, I was saying that here too, um, the director takes charge after the story is written. But you know, the writer is not kind of written out. Uh, whereas in in Bombay, it is the case. So. Uh, I mean, Anurag was very, otherwise very open and so on, but I really didn't have anything to say about how things were progressing. Mm -hmm. You know, as as I went uh, to the shooting in 
Sri Lanka, I went twice. Um, and there were some things that I suggested, you know, some of which he uh, accepted, some of which he didn't. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, at that point they saw me mainly as, uh, I mean, I think they don't understand uh, history. Uh, they understand history to mean just sort of factual detail. Yeah. And so I didn't see myself as being a fact checker there, you know. Uh, it was more a kind of a sense of uh, what is the historical sensibility that you are mm -hmm. conveying. Um, so, you know, one of the things, so for example, uh, I wish I had been part of a kind of a workshop in which I could have then explained to Anushka that since you come from Goa, you don't speak Hindi like a Delhi girl. But her character comes from Goa. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's... The character comes from Goa. So, so when Goanese, you know, speak Hindi, there's a lot of yes men, you know, no men, you know, it, it's a different kind of Hindi, particularly right. in Mumbai. Um, now, had I been part of some kind of workshop, I would have sort of pointed this out that, you know, language is part of what gives you a kind of a place and uh, oh. sensibility. Um, so there were, you know, things of that sort. Uh, and I think in my script, the city was more present than it's in the film. Uh, but still, I mean, I think overall, I'm just happy that the film got made, mm -hmm. whatever it's kind of a commercial reception. But since my money wasn't involved, <laughs> I don't, I don't mm -hmm. bother. But... Uh, uh, but, you know, I think the reception uh, kind of puzzled me because uh, I I mean, I, I can understand some of the critiques, you know, maybe the, um, the city uh, ought to have been more present. Uh, and I think the, the Rusi Karanjia character should have been also more central than uh, mm. it was mm. and finally in the film. Mm. Uh, so there are the things that, you know, one can critique, but I mean, I think partly uh, the reaction was that, you know, I think Anurag had a certain image of, you know, a filmmaker who yes. makes gangs of Vasipur. Right. So, so then people said, you know, Are, this is not gangs of Vasipur. Mm. On the other hand, because Ranbir Kapoor and Anushka Sharma were there, other people expected Ye Jawani Hai Diwani. Right. But it was not Ye Jawani Hai Diwani. Uh, it was very stylized. So I think it sort of fell between different genres. And so, you know, commercially it didn't, didn't work. Uh, yeah. But, you know, but I, I said I'm still thankful, you know, because... It, I mean, the history of both Hollywood and, and Bollywood, the uh, floors are littered with, you know, unfinished projects, you know. Yes, yes. And, and that, yeah. So uh, maybe, you know, when time passes, people will see the film differently. Uh, this uh, glimpse of your journey is itself very rich. And I'm sure after, if we have <laughs> an... Uh, 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 a post pandemic time and hopefully we will uh, mm. there will be plenty more to hear from you because I, i'm sure you're up to some new projects uh, yeah yeah I've, I've, i mean uh, lately uh, i've i've been rereading fanon and I, I have a whole new uh, thing that i'm working on uh, which got actually interrupted by this covid I was hoping to see uh, the records of uh, Mulkraj Anand in National Archives. Okay. Uh, so I am sort of working on this sort of idea of third world as an imagination. Uh, uh -huh. And usually that story is told mainly in kind of geopolitical terms, as if third world is a place. 
mm-hmm. uh, and it's often seen from either uh, New York or, or Washington or Moscow. Uh, right. Third world sees just part of this kind of Cold yeah. War. Yeah. Um, well, I want to kind of flip that traditional narrative, which sees the post World War II period as a period of Cold War, and I want to say that it's actually a period of anti-colonialism continuing. Uh, and third world is part of that imagination. And it's it's that kind of long history of anti-colonialism, which of course collides with the Cold War, but it has an independent existence. So that's what I'm kind of now working on. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Yeah. Nice yeah. meeting you. Nice and, meeting you. Uh, and inshallah, we'll meet in person. <laughs>